Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sing Ray's webinar of the month with John Barclay. And we are going to be doing a little bit of something different. Uh, he's going to talk to us about his program, Dream, Believe, Create, uh, which uh, reflects his artistic journey. He began his journey with a few skills, but aspired to be better. After watching and learning and gaining a bit of confidence, he began to see photography not only as a reflection of the world around him, but also the representation of the reality inside him. Um, this photographic journey freed him to create what was uniquely his, being genuinely aware of the beauty around him as he looks through his lens, feeds his soul and brings him great joy. And I know that we all want to find great joy in our photography. Mm. So thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. And thank you for those who are continuing to, to come on into the discussion tonight. Somebody just said Freeman's one of my heroes too. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, I've trained, trained him with him. Yeah, I have too. As a matter of fact, I went to South Africa with him. Okay, well, welcome. A lot of, I had asked earlier when there was just a few, how many might have seen this presentation. And I know a few friends are here now. Um, but let me just start before I switch over to the slides. Uh, my presentations are more inspirational, motivational is what I like to do. I mean, I can do discussions about how to use filters in the case of Singray, who's uh, very graciously given us the opportunity to have the series be part of their great series. And uh, certainly um, as an ambassador for Singray, I love their products and highly recommend their filters and, and can talk about that. But I asked them permission to do a lecture that I've been doing for a number of years because I think we need inspiration and motivation in these difficult times that we've been in. So I hope you'll enjoy what uh, a slightly modified version of a program that I've been doing for a number of years called Dream, Believe, Create. So where did it come from? I like to talk about, I have three major lectures and one kind of coming, which will be titled Through the Lens of Love. Um, and this comes from watching and paying attention to others. But this particular one, Dream, Believe, Create, comes from my own life. And, and I can remember being a kid and loving the space race. And so I wanted to do everything I could possibly do. And I believed with all my heart that I could become an astronaut. And then you, know, you become an adult and you go, crap, that's hard. <laughs> you know, it's really hard. But at that time, I really believed that I could. And then you know, photography came along and I wanted to be a good photographer and I saw Nancy Rotenberg specifically her images at, at a web not a webinar but a workshop I went to and I came home and said to my wife I said I, I can't do that I'm not creative I can't draw a stick figure I'm not an artistic person and her images were so amazing I felt a little depressed about it honestly and then I started taking workshops and learning and it was with a lot of her help that I started to get back to dreaming about what I wanted my photography to become. And then I realized if I could dream again about what, it, what I wanted and then really, really believed that the creative part became kind of automatic. And so let's share the screen here and get started with some of my thoughts about this journey that I've been on uh, of, for what I call dream, believe, create. So with that introduction, let's kind of start with a, a couple of thoughts here. You know, Ansel said that you bring to the act of photography all the pictures you've seen, the books you have read, the music you've heard, the people you've loved. And I would just go on to say, to make it even more uh, meaningful and impactful, what really Ansel is saying here is you bring to the act of photography 2020. Right, you bring the coronavirus with you. I don't care. I mean, that we just went out and did Colorado. It's the first workshop we've done since February. It's really the first significant photography. And man, was I being influenced by 2020 and this thing called COVID that we've all been dealing with. And that is going to affect how you capture images, how you process images. It just is gonna have a major impact on you. So for me, I'm drawn to specific things that are because of who I am and the life that I've lived and the things I've surrounded myself with, the books I've read, the pictures I've seen, all that stuff, right? But really what starts to make a difference in, in your images is when you start to create 
with your heart and not necessarily with your head, right? So understanding technical knowledge is critical and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the images that make my heart sing and typically are going to have a, an impact on someone else are those that are created from the heart. So what should you photograph? Well, first of all, don't let anybody tell you what you should and shouldn't photograph. Rather think about it this way, photograph what makes your heart sing. You know, here's an old uh, ambulance being reclaimed by nature. And some people might say, why would you waste your time on an old rusty decaying car? Because I think there's a really great story there. And, and I really, in the nicest possible way, I don't really care what other people think about what my images look like, feel like, what they're of because they are they I am being taken by something and I must photograph that so I'm paying attention to what makes my heart sing things like very simple scenes in San Miguel Mexico uh, things like my granddaughter who I adore and I'm not really a people photographer but having grandchildren has certainly helped me become one and fall in love with the possibilities friend of mine introduced me to boxing and all of a sudden I realized that maybe I like people photography more than I thought I would and he got me access right up close to the ring of this uh, amateur bout and it was really a lot of fun and completely different. I adore flowers. I mean who doesn't right? I mean they're just magnificent extraordinary gifts from God and they are beautiful and I love simplicity and organizing things in this fall time frame. This is uh, Henry Mercer's uh, Font Hill Castle which is about a mile and a half from where I live in Doylestown, Pennsylvania and I waited for years. I saw someone else make an image very similar to this, and I was inspired to wait for frost on the lawn, leaves still on the tree, framing the, the castle. And you know, this you talk about it, making images that make your heart sing. I was jumping up and down and doing you know circles when this happened that day. I'm my nickname is Skyman for people who have traveled with me. I just adore good skies. I'm always looking up. And here I am in the Palouse with just a spectacular moment and opportunity with this great sky. I love simplicity again as, so that I might be able to put words uh, somewhere. And then I, I like photographing, again, what we're talking about here, things that make my heart sing. So let's see if this plays properly here. Yeah, it does. Hopefully you can hear that. So again, we're talking about what photographing what makes your heart sing. Many of you may know who this is. It's my childhood hero. I was a musician, still am a musician. Uh, but in high school, I played trumpet and baritone horn and tuba. I played in a Dixieland band professionally and, and Maynard was my idol, an upper register, which we call screech trumpet player. He played in the stratosphere and he was one and only Maynard Ferguson and just brilliant. And I had the chance to be at a local school here right in Bucks County, Pennsylvania and make some photographs of him. This is one. And only because I was photographing my hero. I was the only one there with a monopod with a brand new 1D Mark II in um, Canon camera. I didn't even know how to process a raw file. I'd had it for days and been a film shooter before that. And so I was making these images of Maynard and just falling in love because this is my hero and just being right up next to the stage and capturing these images was just pure joy. Well, I didn't, as I said, I didn't know how to process the image. And so finally I took, this was like uh, November of, of 2004 is when I made these images. In August, specifically August the 23rd of 2005, I finally figured out how to process these images. And I, um, I got this one and I said, you know, I, I kind of like this image. And then I got this one. And what I did is I put it up on a photo sharing site at that time. We didn't have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We just had this thing called photo.net for some of you older folks who might have remembered that. I think it's still around. And I put it up on August the 23rd, woke up on August the 24th of 2005. And the, com the first comment I read on this picture was, that is so weird that you posted that image of Maynard last night because Maynard died last night. 
And man, you talk about goosebumps. I was like, wow, that is just bizarre that I would finally get around to posting an image of Maynard. Well, I felt horrible. I mean, this, he was part of my childhood and I would like try to play along with his albums terribly because I mean, he was unique and great and I was just average. So I got a hold of the, uh, the, the tour manager and Sargent told him I had these images. I'd love the Maynard Ferguson family to have them if they would like them. I turned out to have this image on the lanyard for the um, tribute concert in St. Louis. And then they called me back three months later and Ed Sargent said, John, what you don't know is Maynard played what will be the last notes on any album that'll ever be produced about three weeks before he passed away. And we'd love to use your image on the cover. Would that be okay? And so because I was photographing what made my heart sing, I ended up with this cover shot of what would be Maynard's final album. So photograph what makes your heart sing. And then start to think outside of the box with your photography rather than just thinking about very technically and being focused on maybe capturing what's there. How about capturing what you're feeling? And here for me, I was seeing these grasses out in Utah. This is many years ago. This was a slide, not, not digital. And you know, just taking a picture of grass would be very uninteresting in my mind. But if I moved my camera over like a fifth of a second, I was able to get something that expressed for me the connection that I had with that grass, which was color. And you didn't need to know, even know it's grass, it could be abstract. But we, in order to do these things and start to express from our hearts, you need to know your equipment kind of inside out and backwards. I, I, have a, I grew up, I said I was in a Dixieland band professionally for a while. You know, again, I was an average tuba player in that band. I could, I could carry the, my weight, but not, not great like some of the other players. Well, Jimmy Fryer still plays to this day at the Blue Note down in New York City, which is a big deal. If you can play the Blue Note every week, and again, not right now with COVID, but he was, that's a big deal. He's a, a great trombone player. Matter of fact, here's, here's Jimmy. <laughs> Just, just makes me smile every time I hear Jimmy play. So the question I always ask is, so how'd that happen? How did Jimmy get that good? Well, Jimmy practiced every day for hours. Me, I did 30 minutes because my parents would have whipped me with a, a ruler on my knuckles, right? But, uh, you know, so I was good, but I wasn't Jimmy. That's for sure. Jimmy was extraordinary. Well, it's the same thing for your photography. You've got to know your gear so well that it gets out of the way of the creative process and you're focusing on what's coming out of here, out of your heart, right? So know your equipment so that you can start to express things maybe by moving your camera again over a fifth of a second, or maybe moving your camera over seconds, right? Rather than a fifth of a second and getting something different or being at Steptoe Butte and the Palouse and that beautiful late light. And I'm moving side to side and creating something else other than what's there as an abstract or an expression of what I'm feeling. Being near the ocean and again, moving my camera, a foggy day at the old pier at the 59th Street Pier, which is no longer there near the Cape May area. And again, just it's, it, to me, camera movement is really truly like being an artist with a paintbrush, but we're a photographer with a paintbrush. And so multiple exposures, but back to the comment about Jimmy and the trombone, if you don't know where multiple exposures are and how to turn them on and what particular settings you have to set to whether they be additive or subtractive or darker or lighter, right? There's different settings nowadays with multiples on Canons and Nikons at least. Um, you're not gonna be able to respond to that moment and make a multiple like this one or make a multiple and a swipe. Here I'm doing a multiple of eight and I'm swiping, I'm moving my camera during an exposure and doing about five or six of those and then combining those two together, this was film again. But knowing techniques and understanding our skills so well allows you to be screaming at your tour partner, Dan in this case, it's scorched earth, literally. It's 12 o'clock noon, harsh, horrible light. Um, 
but I'm screaming at him, Dan, stop. You got to turn around and go back. Two miles later, he finally believes me that I'm serious because I knew with the technique that I could make something other than what was there and maybe even lean towards fine art with a multiple exposure. I'm one of those who says, I don't know what fine art is. I think it's in the eye of the beholder. I think it's a little pompous for me to suggest that I can create fine art. I'll let you guys decide. Again, understanding multiple exposures. I'm in Guanajuato, Mexico, overlooking that beautiful sea of colorful houses below you. And I'm just doing an oblique multiple exposure. And here I'm doing like, I think it's three or four seconds and I'm going up, down and then squiggling my camera to get something else over the course of six seconds. I'm not gonna move where I am. And instead of doing this, the next image, I'm gonna do a multiple exposure of 16. It's the same identical stand of trees. I haven't moved, it's the same day, it's seconds later. And then I don't move and I do another one and I do swipes and multiples together. I adore this image. I couldn't do it again if I tried. That's what I love about doing these. But the point is in, th in, in one location within minutes of each other, seconds of each other, I was able to create three very, very different feeling images and expressing how I was responding to that moment in that time. Another option that we have in the creative side of the world is to, to do something called diffuse glow where, where we're doing maybe one soft image out of focus and combining that with a, a sharp image. And we get this look rather than a straight sharp image. I don't know which one is the right one. All I know is I'm going to shoot both typically in a scene like this so that I can make a decision. Do I like this softer glow? Or do I like a sharp image? It's just a matter of how you want to express how you're feeling about your imagery. And here we are, the Orton effect in film days, plus two out of focus, wide open, plus one out on a sharp at F22. We took both of those pieces of uh, film, put them into a new slide mount and created this Orton look, which gives you this, I don't know if you can see, no, I, I tried to use my mouse and you can't see it on the screen, uh, but that edge around the, the yellow flower and the, that really soft glowy edge around the reds, those are created by that Orton technique. Well, we can do the same thing in digital. In this case, I didn't do F22 on my sharp one. I'm F8 because I want those background sunflowers to be out of focus, but pay attention. I'm going to use a long lens and I'm going to, I'm going to rotate my focus so that it makes the flower grow bigger. Bloop. You see that? The flower got bigger. And now that's my out of focus one. I put those two together with something like image overlay or soft light in Photoshop and I create a very similar, those edges around that yellow sunflower are there. We, it's not the same as the density that happens from, from putting um, film together, but you get a very similar look. How about photo montages where, you know, I went to Longwood Gardens, it was frosty eight degrees that day and all that frost on the, the window was just killing me. And so I'm photographing the frost and I finally realized my wife will be really upset if I come home and I don't have any images of flowers because she's a flower fanatic. So I made some images of flowers. But when I got home, the experience for me was best represented by this image. It was the combination of that pattern that the frost was making with the, the sharper flower image. And that can, same thing can be done with texture. In this case, it's a uh, matter of fact, this is from the Smokies where I'm heading here tomorrow. Um, uh, kind of lifty overlook. And all I've done here, and I, and I wanna make this clear because people get confused and always write me about this. In this case, I wanted all that negative space. So I just inverted, I made this scene black and white first and then inverted it in Photoshop. So it's a negative, right? And that, because I knew this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to go get a piece of texture and it can be whatever texture you want. That's the fun about texture work. Uh, it can be any one. And then I put it together with that real negative space. And I've got probably 25 versions of this particular scene because I love it so much. A lens baby is another creative choice we have, right? And, and sometimes difficult to use a lens baby, but boy, when you practice and you nail it, it 
there's nothing that gives the look that a lens baby does. This is kind of a, well, back in the day, it was probably a double glass, but now the Sweet 50 or Sweet 35 gives you this look where you have that beautiful, soft, out of focus edges and you move that lens to be telling me what's the most important part. And in this case, me telling you what, where do I want that sharp part to be? So a lens baby is really great when you're in a creative funk because it forces you to be very, excuse me, mindful of where that sharp focus is going to be. And that's where I'm the viewer going to go first. So here, where do you go? You go to that foreground flower first and all that other beautiful out of focus lens baby stuff is just there to support the, the, the subject. Same thing here with another lily that you go right to the lily, all the other stuff is kind of blurred and allows me to focus right in on that. You just go to the pen and the ink well. You just go to the driver. This is an interesting study in how you read an image. Generally, you go to bright spots of an image first, but here you, you may, I, you find people do, but oftentimes you go to the sharp part second, right? I go right to the driver every time and then everything else is a blurred lens baby effect that helps me to get kind of a, a sense of the Times Square and all the chaos going on there. Lens baby also makes a, you know, a soft focus optic or it makes a, um, what am I looking for? Wasn't that terrible? I'm forgetting the term when it's uh, round like that. Anyways, this this look, gosh, I'm just uh, having a mental fish point. Eye Thank you, fisheye. That's what I wanted. Thank you. A fisheye look, right? And you can do fisheye and HDR at the same time. So hopefully the point I'm making here is creativity is whatever you want to do with your photography and don't let somebody tell you what you can and can't do. And if if you look, Apple just announced the new iPhone 12 with in on the 12 Max Pro, Pro Max rather. I mean, it's ridiculous. I'm gonna have to. I was gonna wait another year, but it's crazy how good the the technology, the computational photography that's coming out of iPhones. But I love the these thoughts from these two guys. You know, gear's great. Look, I love gear just like everybody else does, and I want the new iPhone 12. But vision is way better, way better. It's it's more important to focus on the your vision and bring that forward. Gear is great, but it's not better. Uh, the best camera is the one you have with you. So let me see if I can't drill that home. I'm down at Mug Shots, which is a little place across the street from Eastern State Penitentiary, which is a great place to photograph. It's been shut down for many years, but it was one of the initial ones in our country. And there was uh, Lloyd and I couple of things happened because I had an iPhone and not a big camera to shove in his face. I just said, hey, Lloyd, do you mind if I take a quick snap on my iPhone? You look great today. No problem. Stopped what he was doing. He was grabbing stuff out of the basement, posed for me, and I won an award with this. It's an iPhone shot. Does it matter? Matter of fact, I don't usually tell people what our iPhone shots are not when I post them because it, it's irrelevant. Who cares what the camera is that you're using? Do you like the image? That's really all that matters. And it really doesn't matter what created that image. Another iPhone image in, in Tuscany, I was doing scouting and I don't bring a camera off times in scouting because I want to get the scouting done for people who are paying me money to be with me. And this moment, you know, at the end of the day, love remains. These 90s, they were in their 90s and going about a half a step a minute. <laughs> and they were, I just couldn't pass it up. And come on, seriously, Myra giving mom a break. I mean, Myra, this dog was just special and mom was great. We had a nice chat. And the iPhone just works superbly. I'm heading on down to Philadelphia in the train station kiosk where I'm waiting. I'm going to get some uh, corn across the street and I can't help myself. I'm in Tuscany and yes, I made this image with my big boy camera, but I couldn't help myself. I mean, it's just an opportunity sitting right in front of me. Again, these are all iPhone images to, to just drill home that if you focus on your vision, it doesn't matter what the tool is that you're using. Stop worrying about that so much and worry more about uh, connecting with your subject matter through your vision. And then start to think about capturing essence of things, right? So rather than, rather than focus on all that technical stuff, again, you got to know it so that you can be like Jimmy Fryer and play, but then you can get to the idea of capturing essence. We don't need more of the paper bark uh, uh, birch here. 
and a maple leaf, you know, that happened to fall, no, that John happened to put right there to really get the essence of fall in New England here in the States. Or it's amazing how when I show this to clubs out West, they know that's Fern Spring in, in Yosemite. Uh, you know, other people's essence might be the whole thing surrounded by what's there. But for me, the essence was that insane green reflection that was happening when I was there. I, I had an experience with a bunch of ferns and uh, a couple thoughts on this image. I, it took me a long time to make it. Why? Because I was in a patch of like thousands of ferns and I had to find one that that spoke to me and then work the scene and I remember initially, this was early on in my photographic career, realizing that, oh, I made a big mistake. I broke a big, big rule. I broke the rule of two. I mean, I, you, you're supposed to have odd numbers, ones or threes or fives. And Nancy Rodenberg, my dear friend and mentor, and, and unfortunately she passed in 2011, she came to me and said, no, 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 John, stop thinking about the rules and think about how you feel about things. There's a relationship between these two. That's why to work, they're not apart from each, like, each other like goalposts. They are having this loving connection and relationship with each other. So please throw away the rules and photograph what makes your heart sing rather. And if it works for you, that's all that matters. I just get so overwhelmed and frustrated with people who follow only rules to make images. Rules are going to help you make images that look like everybody else's. And I don't think you really want that. Okay, so here we are again, uh, coral pink sand dunes and that last light raking over those grasses. That's the essence of the moment that happened for me. Somebody else might have been the beautiful sensual curves of the dunes. That's fine. I'm trying to drill home the point that you photograph what makes your heart sing and the essence that is the essence for you, the African blue poppies. Man, to me, this fills the frame with essence. My first take on it was a portrait. It's fine. It's a lovely photograph, nice soft out of focus colors behind. It's all good. But don't you agree that this is a much stronger image and it captures the essence of that flower? I'm going to guess 90% of you here would agree with that. Do I need more than that curly cue of the flower? Nope, I don't need any more of the flower. Do I need the whole barn for you to feel that this old dilapidated barn is falling down? Nope. Do you need the whole red boat to capture the essence of what I was connecting to in this particular moment? But let me caution that essence does not need to be small, tight, small scenes. Essence can be being in the Palouse in the fall, seeing the beautiful uh, harvest happen and the patterns being created by these farmers, the essence was that. It would not be a close-up of the combine, right? Again, your essence is different than my essence. You need to tie into what that is. And again, this, here's the big boy version of this scene that you saw with the iPhone. Man, that year of being in the Palouse, what was, what was just knocking me over was those poppies and we had a great sky and I love skies. And this was, this was it for me, for being out there. So what do we do to capture essence? You know, what we do is distill our images down and simplify the best we can. You know, I bring people to Eastern Sea, uh, no, the Eastern uh, Shore of Maryland. And, and I've made contact with a farm there where they've given me permission. And here's an old Studebaker truck. You don't see those very often, but here's what happens. People show up in a workshop and they go make this photograph or one slightly different. They might stand right in front of the truck, get a wide angle lens and do that. And then they want to walk away. And I'm like, where are you going? Isn't it a great subject? Oh my gosh, John, how often do you see a Studebaker truck? They love it, but they're ready to go get the next great image, right? And I say, guys, you haven't even spent 30 seconds here. You've copied me and made my image. How about finding another right answer? And so they then they I kind of remind them, look, you don't need the whole image to know what it is. And so they start to drill down and they might get something like this. And then I say, have you opened the door? And then they find this and then they go, oh. And now they realize that they have a whole different reaction because now there's a story. The other two are you know, nice images, but they're kind of snapshotty. This is a story of this old, beautiful a blanket that's been left behind that was probably crocheted. Who crocheted it? Why did they leave it behind? Who had the truck? There's a big story going on there. So take your time and work a scene. Don't run to the next one. 
because the reality is the next best image is right where you are at that moment. You're being called or you're being taken and you really don't take images. I don't like that language at all. You make images, that's fine, but you don't take images. You are taken and then you need to tap into what have I been taken by and then make images that represent that. So here I am at the Pemaquid light, uh, Lighthouse up in Maine. I, I'm the only one who's just, just being drawn to the color of the sunrise that's happening way out on the eastern part of the, you know, the shore there. And it's reflecting in that window and I can't help it. I mean, man, am I being drawn to this. So I go and I stay there and I have a party. Well, my buddy Paul Lebby went here and he's got another right answer. I'm up there next to that lighthouse. I don't know if you can see me on the smaller screen, but I didn't move. I was shooting the shadow when it came up and doing all sorts of images because I knew there was no other place I wanted to be. The point is you're drawn to a place to photograph for a reason. Be okay with that. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Photograph what you're drawn to. My buddy Bill Strom used to say this out loud. Uh, he's also passed on. Uh, he says, what if no one has ever seen this before? How do I share its beauty? What a great question. How do I share the beauty of fall reflections with someone in South Africa who's never seen fall reflections? How do I do that? And this is an answer I came up with to, to Bill's question that day that I could explain to them that, you know, the, the puddle of water was in shade, the foliage was in sun, thus it was reflecting into that mirror of water. And it was just gorgeous little ripples being created by ever so slight a gust, not gust of wind, whisper of wind, really. So... How about this idea to, to help expand your abilities as a photographer? How about creating images that are outside of your comfort zone? So pick subjects that are outside of your comfort zone. Here's the story on the Geary building. This is the one in, um, in LA, the concert hall, Disney concert hall. For four years, my buddy Dan Sniffen, who's my dear friend and uh, tour partner for 40 tours we did, one day he said, you ought to go down and photograph the Geary building. I said, Dan, I'm a nature photographer. Why would I do that? I do landscapes. Year two, John, you know, I know you're going out for the medical device show there down in Anaheim. Why don't you stop by at the Geary building? And I said, Dan, I told you last year, I don't do, I haven't, I have no interest in, our, John, I think you'd like it, Dan. No, thanks. I appreciate that. Year three, Dan, Dan says, John, seriously, aren't you going to go down to the, Ge gosh, Dan, how many times I got to tell you? Well, what was really going on for me? That's the important part of this story. I was scared to death. How do I photograph a building? I'm a nature photographer. I have no idea. If I use a wide angle lens, isn't it going to make funny, weird angles? Isn't that a ridiculous thing to ask yourself when you're photographing a Geary building? Geary buildings have weird, odd angles to begin with. But that's how strong what I call FUD is. FUD is fears, uncertainties, and doubts. Well, I had fears, uncertainties, and doubts up the wazoo because I had never photographed architecture. Well, I'm pretty darn happy with these images that I'm showing you. They came from a three-hour session when on the fifth year or fourth year, I finally said to Dan, where's that stinking building so you'll stop bugging me? And I've been back six times. I can't get enough of this building. So the moral of that story is pick subjects that are outside of your comfort zone and, and cause yourself to grow and realize the moral of doing it. And the moral of my story is really this simple. It's just photography. I was so concerned about what to do. I forgot the fact it doesn't matter what my subject is. I just need to do the same thing I do with a tree with um, you know a, a, a foliage scene out in Colorado. It's the same thoughts about composition that I use for those images. I just got myself so scared it took me four years to go there. Don't do that. Do just go explore and have fun. And so assign yourself those projects. In this case, not necessarily out of my comfort zone, but I went to Longwood Gardens and my buddy Bill that I spoke about was a sweater designer. And so I went this time with his suggestion to go look for patterns and design and not photograph flowers. It was huge. It really helped me to see 
very differently because I don't know about you, but I'm going to guess that 99.9 of you <laughs> are going to go photograph those things that are comfortable to you. That we, you're going to go to Longwood Gardens for your 10th time. You're going to do probably the same areas that we just were creatures of habit. And it's much easier to go photograph what's comfortable. This was a great experience. And I've learned to see patterns because of Bill forcing me to do this differently. Back to, you know, Daylin at the boxing gym. I, I'm not a people photographer. I'm, I just don't like photographing people. I don't know how. And Daylin invited me to come photograph this great gym in Philadelphia that was actually used for the last Rocky movie, which is kind of fun. And he brought me down there and I'm photographing two times. I went and photographed this really cool gym without a human being in it. And Dalen finally looked at me and asked the obvious question. John, does it make any sense to be photographing a gym with no people? And I said, well, to me, yes, totally. And he says, why? I said, because I have no idea how to photograph people. <laughs> why would I do that? Do I bring strobes? Do I use a flash? I have no idea. It's too much thinking. I'm not going to do it. And he finally came and, and dressed because he used to work out here because one of his bucket list items are crazy in my mind was to fight and win a fight. That is not one of my <laughs> bucket list items, that's for sure. But anyways, he brought me in there and I started making images in the gym of this experience of being a boxer and the lonely journey of, of all you have to do to get to the point where you could you know, have a fight and win a fight. And it was an incredibly re rewarding experience to learn and a very willing, compliant model who really modeled all on his own. I didn't even have to think about it. You know, and then you get in front of the window light and you got these great opportunities. So remember this image because I'll talk about this experience again coming up. But let's, let's keep moving on a little bit. Yeah, I want to encourage you, just like that Studebaker truck, most people, especially in a workshop I notice, are just not willing to spend time I went out and bought dahlias a lot at one point and I had a great foyer in the house that we used to live in. And I would bring uh, reflecting panels, gold and silver reflect panels. I would bring diffusing panels. I would bring extension tubes, uh, diopters. And I was trying everything to how I could best render these macro shots. And I was really having a good time, uh, you know, but it took three weeks to really learn all about that and photograph what I wanted. Well, you know, now it's kind of funny because I used to bring these flowers home for my wife. And then finally she realized that, that what the gig was. She finally you know, said, no, you didn't. You didn't bring these for me. You, you brought these for you. Just go ahead, take them into the foyer. And I, you know, so I was busted. So it's kind of funny because about a, what, a year and a half ago, she decided, she says, you know, now that uh, you know, the, the kids are gone and the grandkids are, are okay for a moment, you know, I wanna join you and start doing photography. Well, so now here's my wife saying, how's this, honey? <laughs> and I'm like, are you serious, kidding me? And then she says, is this one okay? So now guess who buys flowers for me? She buys flowers for me and I'm okay with that. Okay, how about black and white? You know, with color, I love this expression. I wish I could find out who said it. With color, we look at the photograph with black and white we look into, and I would add the word into the soul of the photograph. I love black and white, because here's, here's to me, why, why do you choose to go to black and white? Well, what am I photographing here? It's a pattern. That's what this is. It's a pattern at a Geary building in uh, at the MIT building in Boston. So let's remove the color. And doesn't that enhance the pattern? How about my daughter, Brittany, my youngest? We have one reaction to a color photograph, we have a completely different reaction to a black and white photograph. The essence, the soul. Why would I take a perfectly good lily photograph, remove the color and go black and white? Because you have a completely different response. That's why. And so be really mindful when you're choosing black and white conversion versus color, there should be a purpose for it. It shouldn't be just a random click of the button. You should develop your sense with black and white photography too, where in the field you're saying, nope, what I need to do is strip away the color because color is so visceral, it can get in the way sometimes. And I just want you to see the bones. I want you to see the essence of what it was that I was drawn to. And these faces down in Mexico that we hire, they're just regular farmers, laborers, and we invite them to come just sit and model for us. To me, black and white or toned black and white is, is perfect 
to get beyond the color that can be distracting and just see the great faces and the stories being told. See, ultimately, the reality here is cameras don't create images. A camera doesn't know how to pick the edge of that flower. The camera doesn't know how to do soft focus or, or put some material in front of that flower to make it look soft and ethereal. Cameras don't create images. You do. You're responsible for every square millimeter of your frame for what's in it and for what's not in it. You're responsible for the choice of f-stop, the shutter speed, and all those things. Cameras are just tools. Lenses are just tools. But creating from your heart and tapping into that and then making that happen is your responsibility. So how do we do all these things that I'm talking about? Well, first of all, you've got to be patient. That's hard for me sometimes. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just want to go on to the next image. But the more I'm patient and the more I practice what I would say contemplative photography for the last two or three years, it, I find my imagery has gotten much, much stronger because I'm willing to pay the price to be patient and let things come to me rather than chase them. And in this situation, I was again at Longwood Gardens. These calla lilies were right behind each other and I wanted them to bleak, be oblique from each other. So it took me, they don't like you jumping in the flower beds at Longwood. Matter of fact, they throw you out. So I'm having to contort myself into a pretzel and get myself in a position where I can make this happen. And then I got some purple stuff and I'm waving it in front of my lens. I didn't pick it. I just, it was right there. They would have thrown me out for picking it too. But, um, and I'm doing that. And so it took a while, it probably took 20 minutes to make this image, not just a couple of seconds, but it was worth it. See, we need to be still and be patient and let those images come to you. So I was in the, in the, the Poconos many, many years ago taking a workshop actually, and I was exhausted. And I had a scene just like this. This is the Smokies actually. Uh, but I had a scene very similar where there was a rock, but it was at the top of this uh, waterfall that was about 40 feet high. And I left my bag at the bottom because I was just exhausted. I was done for the day photographing. And I sat on that rock and I looked around quickly and I went, oh, I'm so grateful I didn't bring my bag all the way up. You know, that in those days, I think my bag weighed 55 pounds. And so I'm so glad I didn't break the bag because I'm exhausted and there's nothing to photograph up here. It's just nothing. And then after about 20 minutes of sitting there, this happened. I'm surrounded by the music of the, the gentle flowing stream. It speaks to me with whispers of ages past. I ponder the stories that have been told to those who have walked along its path. And I'm drawn to the beauty of the tender little fern. It's elegance, it's beauty, it's, it's grace. It sits among the lush green moss rightful heir to this sacred place. And, and then I remember what brought me here and I say a prayer of thanks for the journey that has set me free. And, and as I look to capture the moment, now I see. You see, I needed to be still long enough to be taken. I was so tired, exhausted, that's what I brought to my seeing and I saw nothing, but as I sat, and was still, and I let the images come to me and be taken, I had to run down the bottom of that hill, grab my bag, and start creating images. Don't believe me? Listen to Henri Cartier-Bresson. A photograph is neither taken nor seized by force. It offers itself up. Are you open? Are you ready? Are you prepared to be taken? So back to Dalen, you know, one day, the boxer and that last window light image with the window light cascading in Marley, his daughter is sitting in front of that window on the third time I'm photographing Dalen there in that gym. And again, I'm not a people photographer. It's too hard. I don't know what I'm doing. Can I cut her arms off? I, I don't know what to do. I don't enjoy it, but I knew there was a photograph sitting right in front of me. I had a 70 to 200 lens, 2.8. So I just tried. I went to 2.8 because I thought I remembered that. And I pointed the camera and boom, I got that picture. And I went, whoa, that feels good. I wonder if what'll happen if I try again. 
and again. I don't remember a single photograph I made of Dalen that day, not one. This experience was so visceral for me. It's etched in my soul that I realized I am a people photographer, Doug on it. I can do this if I would just get rid of the fears, uncertainties, and doubts and allow myself the opportunity to be successful with it. Let myself be taken and just let what happens, happens. I made a triptych for Dalen and his wife, Kay, and I gave it to them as a gift. But really that experience was for me. So let's start, oh yeah, I'll be able to talk. I need a drink, that's what I need. So let's spend more time in our own backyard. Yeah, it's nice to travel, but doggone it, if there's ever been a good time, it's COVID time forcing us to be in our backyards, right? So these next images are all within maybe as far as two miles from my house to try to just say, look, I don't need to do swipes anywhere in, you know, in Wisconsin or in the UK or in Australia, although I want to go to all those places. Um, I can do it right in my own backyard. I literally went out to walk the dog on a frosty morning. I said, oh crap, I got to go back in and get a camera. I went on a foggyish day close by and let me turn this off on close by. And I was presented with this beautiful foggy scene. And then I got thinking about Ansel who said, photography is more than a medium for factual communication of ideas. It's a creative art. <laughs> and I went, oh, that means that Ansel was not the purest that a lot of people think he was. He, he, it was, a, you're communicating ideas of how you feel, it's creativity. So I made it a little grainy, like a film grain here and made that fog even more prominent. And then another version, I took away color and brought the color back where I wanted to. Good luck, you should be using all the great tools that are out there with filters from Singray, Lens Baby lenses from Lens Baby, filters, uh, not filters, but rather, but software from, you know, Topaz or um, Skylum. I mean, there's so many great tools that'll help you achieve your vision. That's what you should be tapping into is how do I express my vision and what tools do I need? Black and white, same day as the last photograph, just to a different area. I'm just in love with that fog and the separation. About a, a half a mile from that last image is this image. Uh, across the street, getting corn again to that same barn. Back to the lake, breaking another rule. Rule says don't cut images in half. I don't listen to rules. You shouldn't either. I'm, I'm riding my bike and I find this scene. I go all the way home, get my camera and come back and make a photograph. Again, it's at that time where I lived, it's a mile and maybe a half. Same identical spot. Well, pretty close, within 10 feet maybe a different focal length, but a, a different right answer on a different day. So how do we do all this? And thanks for hanging with me for this long. We're, we're coming down the home stretch here. Um, you got to practice. And let's go back to, to the, to the um, um, music analogy here. You know, think about me with the tuba or Jimmy with the trombone or Stevie Ray Vaughan with a guitar. Can you imagine, you know, Stevie, let's take Stevie, <laughs> goes to his mom, says, man, I want a guitar. And, and she does all she can do to get a guitar for him. And, and she says, but Stevie, no, he says, rather, he goes to his mom, it begs and begs him, you know, come on, mom, I really want a guitar. And he says, and I'll even practice for a half hour once a month, I promise. And I know there's chuckles out there, or, you know, when I do this live, there's always a chuckle, but they quickly realize that, that what I'm talking about is them. They go buy camera gear and maybe four times a year, get it out and make photographs. And they wonder why they're not getting better. It takes practice. Now I'll let you off the hook a little bit. Practice can be Instagram. It's, it doesn't, it's not better than doing it yourself by any stretch, but it is good to look at other people's work. I differ from my dear friend, Cole Thompson, who's photo celibate, doesn't like to look at other people's work. I think it's fine because I am I think I'm strong enough to still create my own, own images and not be too influenced. But you can look at magazine articles, you can be researching, you can be learning about your gear, you can be reading your camera manual so that you know your equipment inside out and backwards. But the reality is 
to be good with an instrument, you got to practice every day for 30 minutes or like Jimmy, an hour and a half or two hours, right? We need to be practicing more regularly because as Ernst Toss says, the limitation of photography, you're in yourself for what you see is only what you are. So, so the Jay, Jay Mizell said it even better. He's, when he was asking, hey, Jay, how do I make more interesting photographs? Jay said, without missing a beat, become a more interesting person. So take that with Ernst Haas, that it, if we truly believe, and I do with all my heart, that we bring to the act of photography us and all that we are and the, what we've read and all those things, and, and Haas says we are what we see what is what we are, the, the more we can grow as a, as a human being, the better our images are going to be. But let's be careful with those tender feelings of inadequacy to wrap up a few final thoughts here. And what I'm talking about is this feeling when you're, especially when you're in a workshop scene scenario. And I remember being in a workshop and there's 12 photographers lined up at Bryce Canyon in Utah. And I remember everybody going like this, ooh, ooh oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. and I am a new photographer and here's what I'm saying in my head. What? I mean, I was clueless because I was so new. And so what was I feeling? Inadequate up the wazoo. I mean, just like, why can't I see what these other people see? So what did I do? I started looking through all the review finders and went, oh, got it. Oh, oh, oh. But you got to be careful because that the feelings of inadequacy that are invariable, real, invariably real, have nothing to do with you. They have to do with them. So that joy that they're experiencing is because they've had more experience than you have. So what? Just be happy where you are in that journey and try to lovingly, gently push those feelings of inadequacy aside because they're going to bubble up, but just recognize them, acknowledge them, and then just say, yeah, not dealing with you today. And don't let anybody tell you what you can and can't do. I've said that probably three or four times today to this group. And I mean that sincerely. I was at um, Zabriskie Point here in Death Valley one year, many years ago. And I had photographed here many times. I've probably been 20 times to Death Valley. And, and I'm using my camera and I'm doing swipes. You know, I'm doing this. I'm, if you'll see the little picture of me, I've got my camera. I don't have one out right now, but I was, you know, I've got it in my hands and I'm moving it left and right or up and down. And I'm doing those fifths of a set at Zabriskie Point. And there's this, I'm six foot six. So I forget what that is in uh, centimeters. What is that? I forget. I'm terrible at that. But hopefully you guys in Australia are smarter than us here. We just don't know how to do metric yet. I know. Silly. But uh, six foot six. So I'm very tall. And there's a guy that might have been five foot two next to me, really short. And I could see him being very inquisitive. And he's kind of looking up at me like, what on earth is he doing? You know, not on a tripod. And he's moving this camera. What's he doing? And finally, he musters up the courage. And he, honest to gosh, this is a true story. He says, what are you doing? <laughs> and I look down, you know, on him. He's really short. And I'm looking down at him. And I said, I'm doing swipes. And he looks back up at me and and in all seriousness, this is exactly, I'm not making this up. He goes, that's stupid. Now I looked at him down. I, I looked way down at him. And I've got three choices at that point. I can whack him over the head and make him five foot, but there's a guard, not a guard, but a, a um, park ranger there. And I figured that's probably going to get me thrown out of the park. I don't want to do that. The second one is kind of, in my mind, the... Um, the human one, the human one is, yeah, you're right, stupid. Because again, you're fe that feeling of inadequacy kind of creeping in again, like, yeah, he's probably right. This is kind of dumb. I should do it on trees. I should only do it on trees because that's what it looks good on. But not me. What I did is I said, but, but look, I'm creating a patchwork quilt. <laughs> and it was great because his reaction was perfect. He went from that stupid to that's so cool. And he loved it. He was just like, wow, that is awesome. I think I'm going to try that. So don't let anybody tell you what you can and can't do. You're only supposed to do swipes on trees, John. Now, try it wherever you want to. 
And do just once what others say you can't do and you'll never pay attention to their limitations. Again, stop allowing other people to determine what your successes are gonna be. It makes no sense to me. As a matter of fact, stop asking people so much about your images. Yes, it's nice to have a mentor maybe, it's nice to have somebody working with you, but at some point you've gotta to get to that place where you're okay with your work and, it, and if somebody doesn't like it, that's fine. If you like it, that's really all that matters. And then start celebrating more. Celebrate what's right with the world. My friend DeWitt Jones, that's what he's known for. He's got a whole website. If you don't know about it, go sign up for Celebrate. You'll get a, an email every Sunday with inspiration, a beautiful image and an inspirational quote. Totally worth it. He's a, a, a brilliant retired uh, Nat Geo photographer. And he has this whole thing, celebrate what's right with the world. Well, let me tell you my story of celebrating what's right with the world. I went with Bill that I spoke about before and I tried forever to make a good photograph and I have failed miserably at this tree up in the Poconos. But Bill liked to go to this Tom's Creek area and I hated it. And so guess what happened? My mindset was not celebration. I wasn't celebration, I was annoyed. And bringing that energy to this stinking location I failed every time. And then finally in my head, I had just watched DeWitt's Celebrate What's Right With The World video, by the way, watch that on YouTube. It's been seen a million times, literally, and you need to go watch it. It's called Celebrate What's Right With The World by DeWitt Jones. And if they'll let me, by the way, if they'll let me send uh, lecture notes, I have all of the quotes and all that stuff in a beautiful PDF. And I, sus I suspect uh, Sing Ray will gather all these names and we can, I'll, I'll send that to everybody uh, free after this. So you don't need to worry about remembering these things. Uh, and I'll include in there DeWitt's links too. But I finally changed my mind and I said a little bit and I said, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I brought the wrong attitude. I'm going to start thinking about how do I celebrate what's right with this place that I never can. And I looked in that tree a little more closely as I was walking back to the car to take a nap, ran and got a macro lens and made this image. So you bring to the act of photography, your attitude. And so start celebrating what's right with the world everywhere you go. And then be careful of the expectations that you bring. The expectation that I'm gonna have fog at this location, it doesn't show up, what do you do? I expect to have fall foliage in the Smokies next week. What if some of the trees are bare? What do I do? So be careful, those expectations can really get in the way of your creativity. Don't let them control you. Okay, so let's, let's really get towards the end here and don't go where, where the path may lead. What I'm really trying to encourage you to do is go instead to where there is no path and leave your own trail, create your own images. See, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. So what, what we're talking about here is this whole dream, believe, create, right? So I was doing this lecture for a group um, and Liz Lawler was there and Liz is a dear friend, a brilliant PhD professor of science, really smart. And as I'm talking about dream, believe, create midway through, all of a sudden I hear her just whisper, it, it's so hard. And I could barely hear her, but I thought I heard her say, it's so hard. So I said, what did you say? And she says, so hard. And I went, what's hard? What are you talking about? She says, this it points at the screen. She says, that second word is so hard. And it just really caught me off guard because I'm saying, what? What are you talking about? You don't believe you can be a good photographer. You are one of the smartest people I know. What's so hard? And then I went home and really started thinking about it. And I realized she's exactly right. We can dream all we want, but if we really don't believe that we can do this thing called photography or that we can be a creative person, the creative part's going to be really hard. But I know for a fact, because remember I started this with, I'm not a creative person. I'm not a people photographer. I'm not a lot of things. But it wasn't until I could believe that I could do this, that the creative part became, I'm not going to say easy, but it became much easier. So I would encourage you to start advancing in the direction of those dreams that you have about what you want your photography to look like. Because as you endeavor to do that and live the life which looks like a photographer, you're going to have unexpected success, right? In, in, in the common hours, right? So 
be bold. What you can do or dream you can do, get busy, do it. There's inertia with that. You just start to do it and then you'll find the magic in it. Each of you has an experience, have experiences and talents that are exclusive to you. Stephen Covey in his, his landmark book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People said that, and he said, you've got to trust them. I put, you got to not only trust them, but believe, right? That you have those talents and you have those experiences because everybody does. There's no exceptions. See, great dancers are not great because of their technique. They're great because of their passion. Great musicians are not great because of their technique. They're great because of the passion. Great photographers are not great because of their technique. It's a part of it, but their passion is what really brings them to that next level. Let's finish with a, a quick video clip here to drill home one last point and then we'll be done. Let's, some of you may have seen this. I'll kind of narrate behind it. We hear, we hear someone playing a violin. It's a subway station in uh, Washington, DC. I'd like you to pay attention to what people are doing. What are they doing? Especially as it speeds up here a little bit. Well, you know, normally if there's an audience, people are saying things like, well, they're, you know, they're just passing by. They're not even stopping. They're you know, going to work. They're going to get on the train. They're going to subway, right? Every once in a while, you see somebody stop by. He's got a case open. Well, what you need to know is this is Joshua Bell. And Joshua Bell, the evening before at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., was dubbed the honor of being a national treasure in the United States of America. People paid $1,000 a ticket to go see Joshua. And everybody's just wandering by. They're not paying attention to what's turning their head. They're not paying attention to what's taking them, which is my common theme here, right? And finally, here near the end, we're going to see this one woman who stops and really listens to, to what Joshua is doing here. And this was an experiment done by the Washington Post to dress this world famous musician up, you know, with a ball cap, playing a million dollar Stradivarius in a subway with a, with a violin case open, try to collect money to see what would happen. And there's our gal, there's two of them there, the one gal in the red in the back, but this one with the shopping bag is the one we wanna hear from here in a second. Yeah, we have a few who finally huddled against that wall and are paying attention, realizing that this guy is not just an ordinary violinist. He's extraordinary. So he finishes and, he's, and he fidgets here for a little bit, right? And finally, this gal says something. Let's see what she says. You'll see it on the screen here in just a second. I saw you at the Library of Congress and it was fantastic. This is one of those things that could only happen in Washington, D.C. And Joshua says, thank you. So if you've seen the movie August Rush, the very last sentence, the very last dialogue in that movie is the music is all around us. All you have to do is listen. Well, well I would say that the photographs, the images to be made are all around us. All you have to do is be taken, right? All you have to do is see. So listen to your feelings and then use them in your work. See, develop your vision, master those technical aspects, but above all, engage your heart. Connecting with your emotions will allow your images to sing. I was at this old abandoned place in, in, uh, in Maryland, and I made these really you know, bright, gaudy HDR images because that's what I was feeling. Yet, when I got back, somebody sent me an email and said, do you know what happened there? And I said, no, well, what happened there was atrocious. There were children there who were horribly abused to the point of death. And they were buried out back to be hidden because nobody wanted these difficult, mangled children and retarded children. It was just awful. And guess what? My feelings changed. 
And I had to go back and reprocess the images with the new knowledge that I had. Very different images. And even to write something, the light of truth and a ray of hope for these poor kids who were totally abused and discarded. I was angry. I had rage with what was done at this place that had been shut down. I never wanted to photograph again. There was too much hell. But you tell me that your feelings don't matter. They matter greatly and you need to pay attention. So show up at 3.30 or 4 in the morning for a beautiful sunrise. Show up physically, mentally, spiritually, prepared with your gear, prepared with knowledge and find joy in that journey. You could be working, but no, I was with Dalen one day and he was saying, hey, I got a good idea. Let's stage a picture of me beating the crap out of you. And I said, I'm not sure I like that idea, <laughs> but we did it. We had a lot of fun. And finally, you know, when out photographing, it's with a sense of play, no bounds are in sight, anything's possible, the unexpected welcome. That's what I want you to do. I want you to go out with that sense of play and photograph what makes your heart sing. So let's get back to dreaming big. Let's believe that we really can achieve our dreams and then go out and create your own unique images that make your heart sing. Thanks for being patient and, and sticking with me on, on a long presentation. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. So that I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Maybe I did. Yep, you did. Uh, did I stop? Oh, I bet I need to go back here. Hang on. Oh, there we are. I had to press another button. But anyways, um, hopefully you found some value in some of those thoughts. They're, they're just thoughts from my heart. It's it's my journey and my process with photography that helps bring me great joy. So let's see if there's some questions that I might be able to help. Well, we had a couple of questions in the chat window. Someone asked where they could find a link to your workshop. Oh, I don't hear you. Uh -oh. I don't hear anybody yet. Are you there? Um, if the audience can let me know if you Still can Still not hear hearing you. Hmm. Can anybody else hear her? Can we write in the... Uh, so you can hear the speaker. Isn't that weird? Hang on. Try it again. Okay. So, so uh, you know what I had done? I had turned the music down on that video. I am so sorry. My bad. <laughs> so, so in the chat window, um, there is a link there to the Singray website where we have information about John and his workshops. And so you can go there and find out. Um, if you wanted to find out what's going on with next month's webinar, you can visit singray.com slash webinars. Um, we've got a couple up there that you can take a look at. And we've just, um, there's been a lot of compliments, John, in the chat window. A lot of people well, saying you. this is the best webinar they've ever attended. Well, and that, that's kind. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, again, it's my heart and I, and I, it's all I can share is the best of me and, that, and I hope it will resonate. I've just looked at a couple, but are there questions too? It looks like maybe there one, do I see? Okay, yeah, let me, let me open that up here. On your flower close-ups, do you use stacking? I do not. Um, I haven't, well, mainly because with flower images for me, again, me, right, not you, I, I want softness generally in my flower photographs. As a matter of fact, I'm generally going to go to a lens baby, whether it be a velvet lens baby to give me uh, that soft look. I've even used sing rays like the Tony Sweet, um, uh, I think it's called a soft ray if I'm remembering the name of that mm -hmm. right. But it's a great filter to create this really soft ethereal effect. And because I like that, I tend not to, to, to feel the need to make flowers be sharp front to back. If you didn't get anything out of my presentation, it, if you want them sharp front to back, you should do that, right? Because that's what's making your heart sing. So please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying what's right or wrong in any shape or form. Just trying to be honest in an answer that I don't because I prefer edges to be sharp and things to be soft and out of focus behind it. Um, Hopefully that helps, but uh, focus stacking is a great concept. I've used it in other landscape situations where I have near far relationships. And certainly there's great value in doing that. And my gosh, is Lightroom making that a lot easier now too, right? They can do that type of stacking. So when you're doing your pans or your swipes, do you have a favorite shutter? I do. 
Um, so I use, uh, I mentioned in the presentation, a fifth, oh, by the way, real quickly, I think I saw one other one that somebody was working a job and they were hoping it was recorded because they missed the first half. I think you can answer that for me, right? Yes, we are recording and we'll send a link out actually tonight. You'll get it by email along with a special offer from Singray. Perfect. Good. So, yep, don't worry, you'll get the whole lecture. Um, and so to answer Shutterstreet, so fifth of a second. And, and I wish I had my camera here, but let's see if we can. So if I'm holding a fifth of a second, I'm going to go about that fast. And by the way, I glue my camera to my face. So I'll take my glasses off and I'm literally pushing the camera. And if I'm doing a swipe up and down, I'm literally going to nod my head. Yes. So when my camera stuck to my face, I'm nodding my head. I'm not moving my whole body because I can't control that as well. What I can do much better is say yes, or if I'm gonna do no, I rotate my torso. It's hard to do this and be accurate, but if I rotate my torso, gluing my camera to my, I'm not literally using glue folks. I'm just pushing it against my face to make it firm, right? And that gives me great control over the swipes. The other one I like is a 15th of a second, one over 15, and it's a much faster, it's this fast. So there's two different looks out of that. One look is very painterly swipe. The other one has great definition. So a 15th is gonna give you great sharp lines and very defined. A fifth of a second is gonna give you much more um, not a technical word, smoothy, <laughs> if you will, right? Uh, and then let's see, do I use filters? Um, absolutely, <laughs> you bet. I, I have a warming pull, and, and honestly, the reason I have a warming polarizer is I've been using Singray filters for a long time, back to film days too, right? And so I had a warming polarizer back then because I really wanted that little bit of warming with film that I was shooting. And I've been very, very kind to my gear. And I've, I've got that thin um, warming filter that I've had for a long time. I also have a neutral one now just because I wanted to try that out and have a neutral one. So the filters that I have always with me in my bag that I just packed again tonight to get ready to go tomorrow is going to be a, a polarizer. And just a quick thought on that. A polarizer is not an on-off switch. So it's not either fully polarized or unpolarized. Be, be mindful that you should be polarizing as much as you want. I have gone all the way from polarizing water so that there's no reflections in a running water stream scene to backing off and letting some of that reflection be there. It looks more natural. It's what you see with your real eye. And I prefer that now. Uh, and then I have five stop ND. I have a 10 stop ND. I have a 15 stop ND because if I'm gonna be doing, you know, midday neutral density, long moving clouds, uh, generally, that's where I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to need a 15 stop during bright midday sun. And generally, that's black and white work that I'm doing. So I don't care what the quality of the sun is. I mean, I do. I always care about what the quality of the light is, but not as much midday because I'm trying to get those long exposures, right? So th those are the primary things. And then I do have like a soft ray in there. And I'll bring that on this trip because I've used it in the Smokies before to get this dreamy look with the fall foliage. Um, I've got a, a blue gold polarizer that I've used on, on occasion. I, I have a, um, a Vary ND uh, in certain situations, but I've gotten to the point with Vary ND uh, that I, I, my workflow works better with a 5, a 10, and a, and a 15 rather than the ND in that case. But, but again, there's people come on the workshop, they prefer a Vary ND with maybe a 5 stop with it so that they can kind of vary, vary in the shutter speed that they want, which is a great idea. And, and then I've got to the point where I don't, I used to always carry grads. I don't as much. Again, that's not right or wrong. I'm just being honest in my feedback because the, the latitude in, in digital exposures nowadays have gotten so good. I generally can pull out what I need from a single exposure with my Fuji gear that I shoot with. So I just don't feel I need grads. Now, does that mean I don't have them with me? I do have them with me because there are going to be those unique situations that are so stinking bright uh, that you're going to want to pull a grad in front of it. But for the work that I do, I generally don't get into that situation. That's why every photographer has a different kit of filters, right? It depends on your style of photography and what you're doing, right? So hopefully that helped with that. Anything else?
Um, we had someone ask what cameras do you use? I am a Fuji guy. So I'm using an X-T3 at the moment for my primary body with an X-T2 as a backup with a soon to be X-T2 infrared body. I'm using an old X-Pro one as my infrared body. And then a, a wide array of their lenses, too many lenses. I mean, I primarily my main go-to lenses are their 1024 and a, and a 100, 400. I tend to shoot on those opposite extremes. Um, but I do have their 56 prime, a 35 prime, a 23 prime, a 14 prime, 90 prime. Their primes are ridiculously good, ridiculously good. They used to make Hasselblad's gear, right? So they're, they know what they're doing with their, with their lenses. I'm a huge of a Fuji fan because of their color renditions. They're just ridiculously good. That's what they did for a hundred years. They were a color company. And I feel like that's what they've done a superb job with their color simulations, especially. But again, if you can't figure me out already, the gear ain't it, right? I, I happen to love Fuji. Olympus makes great gear. Panasonic makes great gear. Nikon, Canon, I, it just doesn't matter what the gear is get the camera gear that you will actually make photographs with that inspires you to use it get that and are your multiple exposure images done in camera or in post gosh you know what i wish most of them were most of the ones you saw were because they were film um unfortunately the one downside of switching to fuji was and i was nikon before fuji and i've shot canon too is i bought nikon specifically so i could do in-camera multiples and with Fuji, I gave that up. So I still shoot multiples in the field and assemble them myself in Photoshop. I still do it. The good news is the new X-T4 um, and the X-Pro, the X-Pro 3, not the X-T3, but the X-Pro 3 was the first camera to bring more than two, to bring nine multiple exposures to Fuji. And the X-T4 now has that too. The only thing I don't know is does it do it in a raw file I think not. It presents you with a JPEG in the field, but that's good enough. That allows me to know I've got the set that I need to assemble in Photoshop now. So I would generally, I would rather do them in the field if I could and see what I'm getting there in, in camera. And what NM filter equivalent do you use with your IR work? Oh, I'm a 720 guy. I'm just a black and white nanometer guy. I don't I, again, I appreciate faux color stuff. It doesn't work for me, so I choose not to. Uh, black and white is my passion, and so I do that. Uh, so a 720 is kind of the standard uh, conversion. I use LifePixel uh, personally, and there's a link. I have a link tree thing on Instagram that you can click, and you can see uh, all of the links that I have for some of the, including Singray's link is on there too. Um, uh, and so, 720, but you know, if you want even more contrast, they obviously 830 is a better choice. If you don't know what you want to do, getting a full spectrum conversion is great because, but the only downside there is you've got to put filters in front of every lens to get those plethora of choices that you have. But for me, I'm an 820 guy. I'm sorry, a 720 guy. Anything else? Thank you. I appreciate that. Very kind comments. Thank you for those. Uh, okay. So I think, does it sound like you will, if I send a PDF to somebody, will you be able to send that along with the link or maybe a separate uh, email to these folks who signed up so they can have the lecture notes? Is that something that would be done? Oh, I'm not hearing you. You're muted. I'm sorry. Yeah, if you send me send me the document and I'll include it in that same email. So it'll be all together with the recording. I'll do that tonight. And again, I would love to, to hear from you folks. Follow me on Instagram at John Barclay Photo, I think. Gosh, I'm so trouble. I think it is. It's John Barclay Photo. Did you already put all that stuff in there? I'm sorry. You put I... a link to your page on the Singray site and they can find your site from there. Oh, good. And then they just go to my site there and they find the link tree. Linktree is, if you're not familiar with that, it's now one click on Instagram and you can see a new page comes up that shows you all of my links. So, you know, the web page is there, the, uh, the, the link to Singray, to Lensbaby, all these different things we're talking about will come up there and you, you can find me there. But we'd love to see on Instagram, Facebook, same thing, John Barclay Photo, website, barclayphoto.com. Thanks again, everybody for coming. 
for taking some time to be with me tonight. I'm honored that you would care to do that, really. I mean, it's a, it's a valuable amount of time, and it always warms my heart to get nice comments back to know that hopefully we've, we've given you an hour of your time that was of value. So thanks so folks and hope to see you in this crazy time, hope to see you maybe in the field somewhere or at a convention or a conference or something where we can actually like shake hands. Wouldn't that be kind of, <laughs> that'd be awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, John, for uh, being our speaker tonight. And we hope that you will all join us again next month for our next webinar. Good job. Bye now, folks. <laughs>